Hello boys and girls, cats and dogs, lovers, lovies, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to look at uh, Omega's Thinnest Automatic, an Omega Constellation with a caliber 712. So let's get going. Now first up I've got some good news and i got some bad news. And uh, I'll start with the good news. The good news is that I have a new camera setup. And the bad news is that I have a troll invasion. These buggers are everywhere, man, after I got this camera set up. So, um, yeah, not sure what to do about it, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, we have this uh, so-called ultra-thin constellation today. Looks pretty good, but uh, it's actually flaking a little bit. On the back of the case. All right, let's have a look at the time grapher. Doesn't look uh, great, but also not uh, too bad. Straight enough and all right. However, we do see that the case back is coming off way too easily, so we'll have to do something about that. And here we can see a little bit of the flaking I mentioned. Checking the rotor for uh, any uh, play because it looks a bit worn, but it's actually okay. So let's uncase the movement. We have to take the bezel off to get uh, the movement out. Now this is uh, caliber 712. There were uh, three different uh, automatics in the 700 series, of which the 712 is the chronometer rated one. I'm actually not entirely truthful because there were also three other variants, but they were only in very limited editions in uh, 1984. So we took the automatic module off, then we can uh, wind down the mainspring. Now Omega is uh, absolutely not known for ultra thin watches. And to be honest, uh, not a lot of manufacturers are. It was a little bit of a fad uh, a couple of times in history. Last time in the early 70s. And this watch is from 1968. So that sort of fits that picture. What they did uh, to make it uh, only three millimeters thick was to come up with a few layered wheels, uh, independently driven or indirectly driven minute hand, and also a very low profile on, uh, on the rotor and so forth. Plus all the bridges are pretty thin. And it's um, kind of strange movement to work on. It's not really that fun to work on because it's Perhaps a little bit more delicate than the Workhorse 500 series. Anyway, we'll uh, see some examples of that. It is not the thinnest movement uh, Omega ever made. That honor goes to uh, the Caliber 700, which is uh, not related to this one. That was a hand-wound movement which can of course be uh, much uh, thinner, only 1.76 millimeters. So that's not really a giant. Oh, oh, did you see that? There was the first roll. I'm telling you. And the Inca block spring came loose. I'll just put that right back. 
Now, as mentioned, uh, this movement has indirectly driven the minute hand. So the cannon pinion is actually on the second wheel. So we're going to use our chronograph uh, wheel tool to take that off. What a uh, bad idea. So we're going to tap that out from the other side. That's uh, the best way to do it. That's what we should have done, obviously. There it is again. Troll season. Well, I know some might say that yes, in uh, Norway it's always troll season, which is true. But I didn't think they would uh, invade my camera space. So I didn't really uh, see this until uh, all the video was done. I was just sitting there and minding my own business like an uh, innocent person would. But obviously the angle of the camera was not so good, so we'll have to do something about that next time. For the winding, there is a wigwag pinion, a little bit similar as in the Thousand series. And that one can be a little bit uh, difficult to get out. Now for that uh, wheel that came loose, we're going to have to rivet that back onto the pinion. So we do that with the staking tool. We first use a uh, concave uh, stake and then we use a flat one afterwards to make sure that uh, the wheel is uh, tightly fitted. Alright, let's get all the parts into the basket. We have magic tweezers that just generate uh, parts from uh, thin air and just drops them. It's pretty cool. All right, so uh, let's get our uh, cleaning machine uh, pulling its weight. Working at the car wash. Ooh. Working at the car wash, yeah. All right, let's start the assembly by putting in a new mainspring can be a bit tricky to uh, press this in sometimes. So if you have something uh, cylindrical of the same size, then that can be uh, ideal. Put some D5 on top of uh, the arbor there. And we're gonna oil the jewels. It's very nice and sunny uh, for periods. Actually, the summer has been really crap in uh, Switzerland, as in uh, quite a few uh, countries, of course, but crappy summer in a crappy year. I was a little bit uh, back and forth here with a lot of sunlight and uh, then all of a sudden shadow or shade. The good news is that I have uh, ordered a couple of uh, cameras. So I'll we'll hopefully start producing a little bit slicker videos uh, quite soon. If only there were a cure for bad jokes, I'd be uh, set for life soon. Speaking of uh, bad jokes, uh, 
my wife is Chinese and uh, it's not uh, really a good idea to joke with the Chinese especially not about the Chinese but uh, those who know me know uh, that I'm not that smart by the way when we're gonna put this uh, wig bag back on and that's the same thing for the thousand series it's good to use a very thin layer of uh, Rodico that way you can screw uh, the screw down into the wigwag. Of course, make sure you uh, remove the radical afterwards. Now, getting back to my dinner party story, uh, the joke I told was uh, the advisor for the American president came running into the Oval Office all panting and heaving. <laughs> Mr. President, I have good news and bad news. Which do you want first? Um... The bad news, said the president. The Chinese have landed on the moon. Darn it, said the president. All right, what's the good news? All of them. My wife didn't laugh like at all. Oh well, we sleep in separate bedrooms now. We're gonna treat the escape wheel and uh, the pallet fork with the fixo drop. What we're gonna do afterwards is just uh, stick the pivots into some pegwood to uh, clean off any residue that might be there. Put some D5 on uh, the second wheel. We're gonna press the cannon pinion on that one on the other side. So for this movement, uh, it's uh, more or less required that we uh, do the train first before we go on to the dial side and the keyless works. Because there is uh, an oil sink that's completely uh, hidden underneath one of the wheels. I know, I know, there are many ways to skin a cat. Don't get me started on that. The setting lever is also a little bit tricky on uh, this caliber. They opted for a setting lever screw to save height. So the best way to do that is to uh, use some Rodico again. I'm sure there are other ways to do it as well, but uh, this works. The reverse wheel is the same as in the 500 series. So we're going to lubricate that with the Lubetta V105. We use another of these... Uh, world's most expensive bottles cost like uh, 80 euros or something for one bottle but I didn't find it actually uh, for half the price uh, somewhere at some point and there we see the troll actually I think it's the nose hair of the troll uh, sneaking in there Apparently it's a relatively common misconception that uh, there are trolls roaming the streets in Norway. And that's not really true. Neither polar bears nor uh, trolls roam the streets. At least not during daytime. I cannot really vouch for what happens at night, but... Uh, Uh, 
All right, so the keyless works. It's uh, relatively straightforward. What is uh, very different is uh, the motion works. So uh, the wheels that you uh, operate uh, with the crown in the outer position to set uh, the time. And what makes it extra difficult on, uh, on this series of uh, movements is that the cannon pinion has to be fitted after the rest of these wheels but it still has to mesh of course so you have to be a bit careful that you uh, manage to uh, mesh it while you press it down uh, firmly enough onto uh, the second wheel so we're going to use a hand press for that could also use a staking tool We also have this interesting little spring that uh, fits underneath part of this uh, triple layered wheel. But these uh, solutions uh, do help make the movement uh, as thin as it is. With the keyless works and the motion works in place, we can uh, put in the pallet fork and let's get over to uh, the other bench and then we can uh, lubricate the pallet fork. Apologies for this being a little bit out of focus, but what we do is to put uh, a little bit of oil, we can also use grease on uh, the exit pallet, and then we rotate the escape wheel five teeth three times, since there are 15 teeth on the escape wheel. And uh, we treated both the escape wheel and the pallet fork with uh, epilam or a fix a drop which makes uh, the oil stick a little bit better to the surface so let's see if uh, this baby runs now yeah that looks nice let's give it a good wind and uh, also oil the different pivots then we can see if we can uh, get a little bit closer to chronometer uh, performance Yeah, we're uh, okay with that. Prefer to have it go a uh, few seconds uh, fast. And with the base movement um, seeming healthy, we can uh, put together the automatic module. Can be a bit fiddly as well. One thing we need to watch out for here is that uh, the screws for the bridges and for the automatic module are actually pretty much the same. But uh, looking at the end of the screws, the screws for the automatic module should be polished. Because they will actually stick up and be visible on the top side of the movement. Additionally, they're a little bit shorter than the bridge screws. So if we freeze the picture right here, we can see that these two screws should be polished and they're also a little bit shorter. If you use the wrong screws, you're going to foul the rotor. So uh, don't do that. 
we're gonna just uh, clean the dial a little bit it's not very dirty uh, there is one mark just uh, around the 12 o'clock marker that's actually not dirt it is a scuff so I'm just gonna wipe off the hour markers and that's pretty much it then we can put on the hour wheel and get the dial on For the hands, we always need to check that those are parallel to the dial and also parallel to each other, uh, obviously. It's not a calendar movement, so we can uh, put the hour hand where we want to. Ah, oh, seriously, man, come on. This is just too much. Okay. But of course, we need to align the hour hand and the minute hand. When the long hand points up, we know it's the full hour. Alright, we're almost there. Let's uh, get the uh, movement back into the case. We did clean the case, of course, in the ultrasonic. But uh, we don't want to polish it. A little bit worried about the gold plating. Which you shouldn't have to be on an Omega constellation, but uh, anyway. And with the movement back in the case, we can uh, put on the uh, rotor. And the case clamps. The rotor has a relatively uh, similar uh, way of fastening as uh, the 500 series. But that little uh, locking uh, piece is straight over the balance. So we have to be very careful with that. For the rotor, there's a rule of thumb that uh, the rotor should uh, stay at the bottom if you rotate uh, the case, like we're trying here. So that's uh, one easy way to check it. Of course, going to run a power reserve test on it anyway, but uh, for now, that gives us a good indication that it works as it should. Let's put in a new uh, gasket for the back. And then we have to address this case back that was too loose. What we can do there is simply uh, press the case back uh, against uh, this knob you see there by using a crystal press don't need a lot of uh, adjustment but we don't want it to be uh, able to come off by using the fingernail so just a tiny adjustment and that uh, helps all right let's get the watch on the wrist and there we have it the so-called ultra slim uh, Omega constellation with a 712 movement. Very 70s design, but it does look uh, pretty nice on the wrist, I must say. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then uh, clicking like and subscribe will really help us. We'll be back shortly. Until then. Ha-ha.